Okay. Should be live now. I hope everything is okay with the volume and stuff. I know that uh, I think there's a bit of a delay here. So um, it's like a, I'm pretty sure it's like a 10 or 15 second delay. Uh, but if you're in the chat, I would appreciate if you could let me know whether the volume is working. is okay with the volume and stuff. I know that uh, I think there's a bit of a delay here. But if you're in the chat, I would appreciate if you could let me know. I think that the audio is fine, but the camera is sort of lagging, I think. Yeah, there, okay, there is a delay. Thank you, Night of the World. Um, let's see. Okay, well, I think everything is working now. Uh, if there's any issues, just let me know in the chat, but, um, I think everything is working now. So uh, today's stream is going to be on the topic of the death of God, the fact that God is dead, as Nietzsche put it. Uh, so um, just to provide some context, I'm actually writing a book uh, right now, which is it's kind of been paused, but um, I'm hoping to get back into it soon. Uh, I'm writing a book on the death of God. And the working title for this book is Anthros, A Dialectical History of the Death of God. Uh, so I kind of, when I was taking my notes for this, I, was, I basically just went through the manuscript and uh, took note of the key points. And uh, so, yeah, I actually have a lot of stuff I want to talk about, really. And, uh, yeah. So... I guess just to jump right into it, we can begin by talking about Nietzsche's view of the death of God. And right away I'll say that I am not in agreement with Nietzsche when it comes to the definition of the death of God and sort of understanding the way it works. Works. I, uh, My view is uh, distinct from Nietzsche's. Uh, but what did Nietzsche believe? Well, there's many different interpretations. Of course, Nietzsche is a famously ambiguous writer. He contradicts himself. Um, and he has no problem <laughs> with doing so. But I think with the death of God, he sort of does have a consistent teaching here. And for me, it seems pretty obvious that the death of God as an event refers to the moment when, or the sort of process wherein the notion of God no longer becomes believable, specifically within the European Western context. So, uh, according to Nietzsche, due to the developments in science, anthropology, and various other disciplines, um, and due to perhaps even scandals in the church and other, other stuff like that, we no longer believe in God. The, the God hypothesis is no longer tenable. That's what Nietzsche claims. So Nietzsche's view is that when we realize that there is, that not simply that there is no God, but when we kill God, when we remove him from our culture, when we take this recognition that he, there is no longer, that God is no longer believable, and then we sort of uh, cleanse God from our culture, we end up in nihilism because the foundation of the entire Western moral order was the Christian God. The entire, Christ, uh, the entire ethical uh, system of 
of the West for 2,000 years, nearly 2,000 years, had been uh, based on the Bible. But now the, uh, the biblical God was no longer believable. So according to Nietzsche, we end up in nihilism. Now, maybe it's worth touching on some uh, different understandings of the death of God, such as uh, Blanchot's and even Levi Bryant's and other philosophers like that. Like for Blanchot, the definition of the death of God is uh, sort of a moment when, uh, not simply a moment, but it's the active killing of every absolute truth. So Nietzsche... Um, his interpretation of Nietzsche was that instead of the death of God referring to one specific moment in history, it was sort of this event or this action, this act that needed to be repeated. God needed to be killed continuously, and God for Blanchot wasn't just the Christian God. It wasn't this just this notion of God, but it was the um, the very form of the absolute. Now, before I can continue on, I just want to double check and make sure everything is working here, that the live is going well. Um, so I, I think that maybe my camera is going is slow, like the feed for my uh, webcam is slow, but the audio is working. So. Really, that's. I think that's fine. It uh, that doesn't really change much. Um, yeah. So as I was saying, there are different interpretations of the death of God. Uh, for s people like Blanchot and Levi Bryant, it doesn't have to do simply with um, the collapse of the belief in the Christian God, and that's the way I would interpret Nietzsche. Rather, it refers to this continual act of negating everything that presents itself as an absolute truth. It's sort of a deconstructive project in that way. The death of God for Blanchot is a project, an act, that needs to be uh, repeated over and over again. Uh, so, uh, yeah, how would I define the death of God? Well, I guess we can move to the first slide. Hopefully that works. Um, the uh, yeah, so you've if you've been watching the channel for a while. Actually, I don't know how much I've mentioned it on the channel, but at least on my Instagram, I've talked about it a bit. Uh, it's the idea that the death of God is uh, the turn towards man, and I call this turning towards man anthros. That's the concept. That's the term I use to refer to this act of moving towards man. Um. So, uh, yeah, in the beginning of my book, uh, entitled Anthros, I begin with one thesis and two principles. The thesis is that the, uh, de yeah, okay, the picture is frozen, uh, gotcha. One second. Um, yeah, I don't really know how to fix that, really, the, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So if the audio is fine, I'm just going to continue. Um, uh, yeah, if the audio is fine, I'll just continue. Um, yeah, so anyways, uh, I had one thesis, two principles. The one thesis is that the death of God is the turn towards man. And the two principles is one, there is no singular cause of historical change. And the second one is that the individual precedes the universal in history. Um, yeah, so let's talk about Anthros first. I think that this really isn't too difficult of a uh, concept to grasp. And again, I've talked about it on the channel before, especially in the videos that are currently private for patrons. But um, that's this is the idea that the death of God isn't a purely negative. Um, uh, it's not purely negative. This, I think, is something that Nietzsche would claim. Nietzsche would claim that the death of God is basically just a negative uh, event wherein um, 
wherein God is negated and we're just left with nothingness. We're left with the abyss, the void of nihilism. But as Todd McGowan mentions or points out in his book, Emancipation After Hegel, there is no pure negation. The negation always uh, comes with a certain uh, positivity. So negativity is never freed from positivity. And I would say that the negative death of God was the positive side of this was the turn towards man. And it's not that there is the death of God and then we confront the void and then we turn towards man. It's rather that the death of God itself occurred through this turn towards man. So the most basic example I like to use is this idea of the subjectivization or relativization of values. This, according to Nietzsche, is the biggest issue with the death of God, or not issue, the consequence. The biggest consequence of the death of God is that values no longer become objective, but rather they become uh, subjective, and uh, they, have no long they no longer have any objective foundation because, of course, in the past, this objective foundation was God. Um, so why precisely, uh, why precisely was there this... Um, this uh, subjectivization of values. Well, my thesis is that it is precisely because the values will, were no longer grounded, they're no longer grounded in an objective uh, foundation, i.e. God, but they become grounded in the subject. So now that values are grounded in the subject, we get this subjectivization of values. They're just an expression of personal opinion, uh, fundament of, of a finite, uh, fallible human being. So there's no objectivity to values anymore. Um, another example of, of uh, anthros we can use is uh, the example of the undermining of the king. And this actually gets to uh, my understanding of the death of God not simply as referring to the sole notion of God himself. And I think this is one of the limitations of Nietzsche. Rather, the death of God as Anthros doesn't just affect the notion of God itself, but the entire Christian worldview as a whole. And Christendom as a worldview included everything from the monarch to the church to other institutions. Uh, all of these together constituted the unified Christian worldview. And I think that in... Um, with the death of God, we have the de deconstruction of this worldview. It's not simply a lack of belief or the deconstruction of the sole notion of God alone. Now, in the example of the king that I brought up, what happens is actually what Marx talks about in Das Kapital. He has a footnote in the, in Capital where he talks, where he mentions how people think that the king is a king. Uh, pe we think that we give. Uh, um, we recognize a king as a king because he is a king. But the truth is that, according to Marx, we um, we think that the king is a king because we recognize him. So it's not that the king precedes the social relation between subject and king, uh, but it's that the very social relation constitutes the symbolic authority of the king. So there is no substance, there is no substantial reality to king himself. The, and what happens in modernity, what happens in the French Revolution, for example, is the king is, is exposed as a mere man. He no longer has a divine right. The authority of the king is no longer considered to be grounded within God, um, but within man, within his own subjective um, and arbitrary, arbitrary claim to authority. So that's one example of Anthros in the context of the king. Now, before uh, moving on, I want to address sort of a potential critique of this notion of anthros, and that's the idea of what I'll call, uh, I've called ecos, but I kind of want to <laughs> get a better term for it. But essentially, uh, it's been pointed out that, well, the death of God or modernity wasn't just a turn towards man, but it was also a turn towards the world, towards scientism, towards naturalism. So how can we maintain the thesis that anthros um, that the death of God is anthros and also not this turn towards the world, uh, towards ecos. Um, and my, my answer to that would be that ecos is fundamentally um, 
the presupposition of Ecos is Anthros. So Anthros is always more primordial and it always comes first. And this is just because of the way human subjectivity works. In order to have this faith in science, in order to turn towards nature and, for example, accept Darwinian evolution, you already need to have the presupposition that man's that we as human beings are able to look upon reality and diagnose it properly. So within this very, we could say, idolatry of nature, there is this fundamental pride of anthros wherein we accept the human being as the final authority who is able to um, look upon nature and diagnose it. Um, and this is fu fundamentally a Christian idea. I've talked about this before with uh, James Cortides, that pride precedes idolatry. The turn towards man, anthros, is a condition of idolatry, of turning towards scientism and naturalism. Um, Zizek actually has a similar critique of these radical ecologist type people who argue that, um, they argue that nature is because it is an organism and because it's constituted by um, fundamentally they would argue the same things as human relations um, like I forget what it's I, I'm forgetting I'm blanking on what they call themselves but essentially they argue that just as a human social order is an organism so is an ecosystem so just like we consider the organism uh, the social a whole to have certain rights and for human beings to have certain rights so does the ecosystem but Zizek's simple point here is that the ecosystem doesn't know that it has rights so in order to even say the ecosystem has rights you already need to presuppose the subject who is the universal who is the one who is the one knowing that the rights exist um, so again Zizek's critique is that within this the notion of of um, th these radical ecologists, their notion of uh, nature having rights, they already need to presuppose man as the universal who is able to say nature has rights because nature itself doesn't know that it has rights. So just this just shows that because of the way subjectivity works, because of humanity, there always needs to be this turn towards man, this presupposition of man and his, we can call it his ultimacy, before what we can call idolatry, the turn towards nature, uh, or the turn towards towards the world. And this ultimacy is why I actually talk about um, uh, Cornelius Van Til's understanding of the fall, because the fall for the Reformed people, the Reformed Calvinists, wasn't an ontological fall, and Van Til is a Reformed uh, theologian. He famously popularized presuppositional um, apologetics. He argues that the fall was literally just a moral failing of man, wherein he conceived of his own self as ultimate. And I think that this fall into considering man as ultimate is sort of the essence of Anthros. Anthros is considering man ultimate instead of God, which would be, um, which would be, uh, Oh, it's, uh, Theos. Theos as opposed to Anthros. So, Night of the World says it's frozen right now. Um, by that, do you mean the audio or just the, uh, just the, um, uh, video? Because, let's see. Hmm. Okay, so I think the volume is working. Okay, unfrozen now. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for letting me know. Just, again, if you're in the chat, let me know whenever it's, uh, it's frozen. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, that's what I mean by anthros, really. Anthros is a turn towards man and considering man as ultimate as opposed to God. Um, now, God is what maintains, I argue, the notion of the subject as substance, the idea that there's, there's a substantial reality behind the subject itself, behind its symbolic authority, for example, in the context of the king. So with the notion of God, we can have this 
idea of a king, an actual existing king that isn't just reducible to a social relation because of divine right. But when we get rid of God, when we get rid of the transcendent, we get rid of this notion of a substantial reality behind authority, and we just get the subject itself. But when we have God present, God is this sort of substantial reality who gives being to the subject, the king, for example, and gives him an objective authority, sort of. Um, so also, I guess we can talk about what I call implicit versus explicit anthros. So implicit anthros is the, I mean, explicit anthros, rather, is like consciously affirming a uh, man as the um, center of reality or whatever. Like in the Enlightenment, we could say that the Enlightenment tried to build a political system that was explicitly affirming man. That was an example of explicit anthros, while we could say um, something like the ecologists that Zizek critiques were engaging in implicit uh, anthros where the uh, where the um, their turn towards man, their their uh, presupposition of of the subject as universal is only implicit within their formulation of ecological ethics. Um, and in one example of implicit anthros that I'll u I I use is uh, object oriented ontology. Now the problem with object oriented ontology, and this isn't a critique unique to myself. I believe Todd McGowan's made it before. And um, in their debate, Harmon didn't really answer this question. And that's fundamentally that distinction doesn't exist within the world itself. Um, in his essay entitled, uh, he uh, what's it entitled? Hegel, Death and Sacrifice, uh, Georges Bataille talks about a swarm of flies and how the flies aren't actually distinct identities because the flies don't have the power of understanding. It's the power of understanding that divides the world into concrete entities. But the world in itself is just a mass of what McGowan calls a mass of data. Um, uh, and so in reality itself, in the world itself, there is no, uh, there is no distinction. Distinctions like, show me a distinction. <laughs> you can't show me a distinction. Uh, distinction itself is an immaterial concept. So distinction is something that only exists for a subject. Um, what this means fundamentally is that when Gr Graham Harmon talks about distinct objects, he's implicitly presupposing the human understanding already. So he is engaging in, even though, and this is the irony of his position, Harmon will talk about how he um, he is um, rejecting um, anthropocentrism, but in reality, in order to think of distinct objects itself without accounting for the human subject, he's just implicitly presupposing the human understanding, or at least some sort of dividing force, some sort of subject which is able to divide the world into discrete entities, into objects. The division of objects doesn't exist in the world itself. So that would be one example of implicit anthros. Um, so now I'm going to read this quote that I put up here by Nietzsche, and uh, it's kind of small for me, but I think, one second, get my glasses. At bottom, man has lost the faith in his own value when no infinitely valuable whole works through him, i.e. he conceived such a whole in order... Um, he conceived, okay, I can't read that, to be able to believe in his own value. Okay, basically what Nietzsche is saying there is that um, this no the notion of God as this transcendent whole who worked through man, this is what guaranteed the substantiality, the consistency of man himself. And this is why what we get in modernity is precisely the divided subject, what McGowan calls the contradictory subject. Zizek talks about the antagonism, the lack at the heart of subjectivity itself. This is what you get when you remove God. When there is no big other, all there is is lack. Um, I talked about this sort of in the video on imminence. Any, without a transcendent perspective, from a purely imminent perspective, um, there is... Uh, 
uh, essentially no uh, um, way of totalizing uh, reality. And I think it'll be easier just to turn my camera off. Yeah, I think that'll be easier for now. So I'll just do that for now um, because it's lagging <laughs> anyways. Um, yeah, so what Nietzsche didn't realize, though, is that the whole God, this whole, this infinite transcendent whole, it broke apart. It um, was deconstructed. It wasn't like an external imposition that we realized that the whole was just not non-existent. Yes, it's happened, but how did it happen? It, it, how did it happen? It happened through Anthros. It's precisely because the whole was identified with man himself, with that which is partial. This is how the whole becomes deconstructed. We realize that God, the whole, is just a projection of mankind. It's just a fantasy. It's our own subjective delusion. That is, that is the essence of the death of God. It's the realization that God himself is nothing more than man. God is the creation of mankind himself. So what Nietzsche didn't realize is, yes, mankind... Uh, the whole work through mankind, and this is how we maintain this notion of us as consistent, uh, valuable subjects, but it was precisely through identifying the whole with us, with our very uh, individuality, individuality, with our subjective delusions, that is how the whole was deconstructed. Um, so, essentially, anthros means that the, we have the turn from God to man or the subject. And this is the basis of my rereading of the parable, the infamous parable of the madman. In the parable of the madman, um, Nietzsche says uh, the following. He says, um, this is how he describes the universe or the world after the death of God. Uh, where are we going? Away from all the suns, aren't we ceaselessly falling backward, sideways, forward in all direction? Is there an up or a down at all? Aren't we just roaming through an infinite nothing? Don't you feel the breath of this empty space? Hasn't it gotten colder? Isn't night an ever more night falling? And this, the way I want to reinterpret Nietzsche and reinterpret this passage is by claiming that the night which Nietzsche is talking about is not this vast, empty, cold universe that doesn't care for us, right? That's not the night that, that is not how we should understand the night in this parable. Rather, we should inter reinterpret this night as referring to the subject subject itself, what Hegel calls the night of the world. And um, <laughs> we have night of the world in the chat, so <laughs> that's cool. But um, the night of the world is the subject itself. I actually just coincidentally have the passage from the Gina lectures where Hegel talks about the night of the world, and he says... Um, he says, uh, the human being is this night, this empty nothing, which contains everything in its simpl simplicity, a wealth of infinitely many representations, images, none of which occur to it directly, and none of which are not present. This is the night, the interior of human nature, existing here, pure self, and in fa phantasmagoric representations, it is night everywhere. Here a bloody head suddenly shoots up, and there another white shape, only to disappear as suddenly. So, Hegel is describing this interior of the self, the pure self, the subject at its core, as the night, as the night of the world. And this is how I want to reinterpret Nietzsche here. When he's talking about, in the parable of the madman, the night which has fallen, um, how does he put it exactly? He says, yeah, the night that is falling. The night we're referring to is not, again, it's not like the infinite universe that is cold and empty and godless. Rather, it's the subject itself. We are confronting the pure void of the subject itself. The subject as a self-relating negativity, as Zizek would say it, the pure void of the I, the abyss of the I. Um, and in the absence of God, this is what you get. You get man as the pure subject of the void. Now, um, I guess now we should go on to talk about the, the first principle, and that is that there is no singular cause of historical change. And this has to do uh, essentially with the fact that the, 
what I call the perspectival order, um, but you can also just understand that as culture. Culture is a network um, that connects together. And when you have a culture that functions properly, um, every piece in this network sort of operates within a similar logic. But the... Um, um, and this constitutes like the network of relations that that is culture. But once you have certain parts of this network become deconstruct deconstructed, it weakens the whole. So when you have the king become undermined, this is both a product of and a cause of the deconstructive deconstruction of the Christian worldview as a whole. So that's all I really mean by there is no singular cause of historical change. It's the fact that everything is connected. There is no one cause, at least one, there's no um, one non-divine cause, but um, there's a, a relationship, a network of relations, and this re these relations constitute the uh, constitute the uh, culture and um, yeah so essentially the death of God then is not simply one piece in the network becoming undermined but the network as a whole unraveling the worldview as a whole becoming deconstructed piece by piece um, in sort of a self-propelling um, a self-propelling um, event a long event that spans several centuries so um we can now, I guess, talk very briefly about the individual preceding the universal. This is just very simple to understand. Like, for example, the Reformation didn't just occur. The universal Reformation that undermined the church wasn't the, that wasn't the beginning of reform. Actually, there were many reformers, individual particular reformers before the universal reformation itself. In fact, Martin Luther at the beginning of his at the beginning of his life was one of these uh, reformers. So um, at the beginning uh, um, of any historical process, there is individuals um, and it uh, either like uh, individuals emerge before the universal collective movement or there's an attack, a deconstruction of individuals. Like you don't just have what the ki notion of kingship undermined um, when we're talking about monarchy. We have the individual monarchs undermined first before we get the transition to parliamentary democracy, for example, or republicanism. First, you have individual kings undermined, but when the revolutionaries realize that this isn't good enough, like in, in the context of the reformation of the church, they realize that these individual individual reformers weren't able to actually solve the problems in the Catholic Church. That is precisely when the universal emerges. So the um, the individual precedes the universal in history. Now maybe I'll try and turn my camera on again just to see. Um, yeah, well, I guess we'll see how that goes. Okay, so next slide, I guess. Time. Uh, time is the second part of my, uh, or the second chapter in the current manuscript of Anthros. Um, so I realize I spent like 30 minutes on that last slide, so I'm going to kind of hurry up, uh, go through this a little faster. But um, here we're, uh, yeah, okay. Um, so let's first talk about the shapes of time. Uh, this is also what I refer to as the deep meme. The deep meme is a term I take from Chad Haig. And Chad Haig understands the deep meme as a sort of shape, a structural shape that um, is based on the crucial resource of a civilization. So for example, the crucial resource of an agrarian civilization is obviously um, grain and stuff like that. And grain has to be harvested in a cyclical fashion. There really is um, a return to itself. And that this returning, this cycle, that 
prov- because the crucial resource is the basis of civilization itself, this crucial resource, the logic of the crucial resource, structures the entire um, culture as a whole, the entire civilization. Um, but I sort of, um, I kind of accept that. I do accept that in a way. I think that's a really good insight. But for me, the deep meme doesn't just refer to this abstract shape with no particular content, because that's all the deep meme is for Chad Hag. It's just sort of a reflection of the logic of the, um, of the crucial resource. Um, and obviously the crucial resource of modernity is fossil fuels, which is why the main concept in modernity is um, uh, progress. Um, what was I saying? But yeah, for me, I want to talk about what Husserl calls the descriptive content of the deep meme and not merely its empirical genesis. So, so the empirical genesis of the deep meme is one candidate for that is fossil fuels. I think Chad makes a really good case that it is, in fact, fossil fuels. But um, the descriptive content, Chad doesn't really explain what that is. But for me, the descriptive content is precisely time. It's the experience and shape of time. Um, so still the Zoom call isn't working, so I'll just stop the video. Uh, yeah, so there are different shapes of time. In antiquity, the shape of time was obviously the circle. It was there was a circular um, um, no, notion of uh, a cyclical time, an eternal return, as it were. Uh, Plato talks about this. Aristotle talks about this. Actually, in my video on uh, Hellenic versus Christian time, I talk about this uh, in detail. Now, Christianity breaks from this notion of the oh. Sorry, it looks like my camera actually was working for a little bit there. So maybe I'll try that again. <laughs> um, well, yeah, well, okay, let's just see if that works. Um, uh, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, okay, Christianity breaks from the cyclical view, and then we get a more, not a progressive view, but, but a linear, irreversible view of history in which things can only happen one time. And then in modernity, we get progress as such. Now, I think that um, I agree with someone like Giorgio Agamben, who in his essay, Time and History, he talks about how he talks about how uh, that cr the break from cyclical time occurred with Christianity. That's when we get progressive linear time. And in a way, I agree with that for sure. But there is still something that happens in modernity. And we, to understand this in a way that Agamben doesn't, we should use the categories used by Byung-Chul Han. Those categories are incomplete, complete and incomplete time. Um, so uh, complete time, completed temporality, is a time in which uh, uh, sorry, uh, lost my train of thought. Completed time is one in which there is a concrete beginning and a concrete ending. And we know that time will be completed in a certain moment. So in Christianity, because of the providence of God, because of the promise of God to, um, return of Jesus, Jesus to return in his second coming, um, and, um, that will be the end of history as we know it. Because of that, there is a completed notion of time. There is no pressure to accelerate in a progressive sense because we're only going towards this end that is already going to happen no matter what we do. So there is no pressure within the completed temporalities to progress. But in modernity, we get an open-ended or incomplete temporality. There is no concrete ending. I mean, there's like the heat death of the universe that that's billions or trillions of years in the future. What we get now is precisely the um, an incomplete or open-ended future which we can progressively increase uh, our speed um, towards because it's there's no wall that we're going to hit. There's no end. It's just a progressive, infinite, linear movement upwards, which, as Chad Haig has talked about, isn't really possible, at least technologically, because of the nature of uh finite resources. It's just not possible to have infinite expansion with finite resources. Um, yeah, so that's sort of these, this, um, that's the structure of, or the shapes of time, what I call the deep memes. Um, now, the 
death of God at the level of of time was the shift from a completed temporality to an incompleted temporality. And since we have defined the death of God as anthros, we need to we need to under we need to um find a way to connect this movement at the level of the shape of time to anthros itself. And the way um, I want to do that is through concepts uh, utilized by Byung-Chul Han in The Scent of Time, one of my favorite books. Um, in The Scent of Time, Han talks about, of course, how now without God we get an incompleted worldview. Um, what he calls in that quote, the, reg the regime change, time loses its hold, or there's nothing holding back time anymore, there's just an outburst of, pro of, pro of this, um, this tendency towards acceleration and progression, but also what we get is what he calls point time and atomization, and that's because in modernity, there is no communion anymore between moments. Uh, communion is a Christian term. There is no connection between moments. All we get are individual atomized points. Um, be and this atomization of time, this is um, what is causing uh, for, according to Han, nihilism and other negative consequences for our civilized for our society. Now, um, we should note how point time is homologous to anthros itself because in the same way that in the christian world everything is connected in communion man finds his place within this larger whole um but then we get um in modernity this turn towards the singular subject this point like subject which ultimately ends as a void um there is a similar structure here and it's precisely the structure of atomization atomization is the Thing connecting anthros and point time occurred through anthros, and the way I'm, I've sort of been doing that is um, uh, by understanding um, the nature of, of man as reflecting the structure of time. So, for example, in the Enlightenment, we have the notion of man who is able to create his own destiny and to move towards the future and build this ideal society. And that's why we get the structure of time, which is one of progress. It's not yet infinite progress, but it is progress nonetheless. But now what do we have? The Enlightenment narrative, it's sort of over. This idea of like a pure, um, eternal peace society is over. Now we just get continuous technological progress in liberal democracy. Um, what do we have now? What What's the anthropology that we have now? Um, to refer to that uh, point that I have that says temporality reflects anthropology. Well, now we have the nihilistic, self-isolated, narcissistic individual. In his book... Um, oh, I don't have it anymore. Um, gave it to someone. But in his book, The uh, Agony of Eros, Byung-Chul Han talks about how the subject, man, is now a narcissistic, self-isolated, self-enclosed individual. That is now um, that is now the way we live, especially this is uh, increased in digital times. We're no longer a part ingrained into this community, into the whole. We're now more so narcissistic. We have an aversion to the other, and we're all within what he calls the inferno of the... So, we, so we've established that we have these self-isolated narcissistic subjects. That correlates precisely with the emergence of point time. And... Um, I actually think there's a one-to-one -one correspondence here, and this sort of gets to my critique of Han. I have a video on that, so I'll just go very briefly over it. And my critique of Han is Han says that point time has already emerged. He doesn't see how the point, point time and atomization itself unravels dialectically. It emerges dialectically. So right now, we don't have point time already here. Point time isn't already here at, at its fundamental level. All we have right now is... Um, a sort of halfway through, prog half progressive, half point time t type thing. We still have a narrative of progress, but it's a sort of meaningless self-referential narrative where obviously every narrative requires an end, but the end, the, that, but progress has become its own telos now. We only value progress for the sake of progress. We're not working towards some overarching end. There is no overarching project of our civilization. We're all just going through the motions, ever increasing um, 
technologically and you know in terms of obviously in the realm of politics uh social justice as it's called and whatever and uh so what am i saying um I, so yeah i was saying that temporality reflects anthropology and oh yeah my critique of han is that we haven't actually reached point time um but point time a pure point time where they're literally because han defines point time as the inability to connect the past and the future to to the present you can't have this organic relation you just have the point that is alienated from the past and future well if that were to occur to occur and we were to truly experience point time just think about it we wouldn't be able to experience time there would be no, no movement of time we would just be these solipsistic individuals stuck in an eternal now but this hasn't happened yet this would only happen, I argue, when you get the pure void of the subject itself, what Zizek calls the self-relating void, the true night of the world. So just as mankind, we have become more narcissistic and self-isolated, but we're still able to talk with others, we're still able to form, perform some sort of relation, and that's because we haven't reached the zero level of the abyss of self-relating negativity. In the same way, time, we're still able to connect past and future, but just not as strongly. So we're moving closer towards point time, but we haven't fallen into the abyss yet. In order to have point time, you would have to have this pure self-relating negativity, the pure void of the subject itself. That's why I argue, argue that the subject that Zizek refers to in Hegel and a Wired Brain is precisely the, um, it is precisely the, um, uh, the void of 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 self-relating uh, of a pure present self-relating negativity. Anyways, moving on. Yeah, so that's all I really have to talk about in terms of time. So time uh, in Krish in the death of God, we have the movement from uh, we have the movement from the um, completed temporality of Christianity to the incompleted temporality of progressive modernity, and this occurs through an alteration in the way, in, the very way in which we see ourselves. Um, yeah. So, the Reformation. Um, the Reformation uh, is something I really like to talk about because I don't think anyone has really has really understood why the Reformation happens, and you had to, you only can understand it through the concept of Anthros. I'm absolutely, I'm absolutely convinced of that. Um, and why is that? Because the Protestant Reformation was the anthropomorphization of the church, where Catholics and Orthodox see God in the sacraments, the priests, obviously the priest, um, they actually referred to the bishop in the early church as the vicar of Christ, um, not just the pope, um, the priest himself. Um, the sacraments, yeah, the, the Pope, holy objects, all of these things that the church consecrate, consecrates and makes holy, makes, infuses with divine grace, that is no longer considered to be, be, have this connection to God, at least for low church Protestants. Now, and of course, prayers to the saints as well. Humans, um, saints are just seen as normal humans who we can't give um, any sort of veneration to. We can't pray to the saints anymore because they're just mere men. So there is the anthropomorphization of the church and the Christian worldview as a whole. And once we get, what they're essentially doing is they're taking God out of the Christian worldview. They're emptying the Christian worldview of God so that sacraments just become symbols or signs. Uh, the saints just become regular humans who deserve no special veneration. Uh, holy objects just become regular objects. And when this occurs, you get the turn towards God alone. You have emptied the uh, world Christian worldview of all of its substantial content, um, and all you get is the turn towards the pure form of God himself, God alone. So sola is an expression, is a type of atomization. Sola Scriptura, the five solas of Protestantism, that is a reflection of atomization because the essence of Reforma the Reformation is the atomization inherent to Anthros. And so what a uh, man, as the liberals would, they recoiled from him in disgust. So just like the Enlightenment, the Protestant reformers saw man everywhere. They saw man in the church. The bishops were not special people. They were just men. The Enlightenment reformers inherited this tradition, this anthropomorphized tradition. 
And all they did was they got rid of the god. They got rid of any sort of personal god for the most part. And we get deism or, you know, um, even atheism. So that is why the Reformation led to the Enlightenment. And that's why even though a lot of the ways it's commonly formulated where Catholics and Orthodox will say, oh, the Reformation led to the Enlightenment, it's not really well put and it's sort of polemic and attacks the faith of the Protestants. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that the Protestant Reformation was part of the death of God because it was uh, embodied the logic of Anthros. And so again, as I said, what the Protestant reformers did was they recoiled from man in disgust. They saw him everywhere, so they recoiled from man and turned to God alone. This is where you get notions like total depravity. The total depravity of man is a part of this recoiling in disgust from the man, the sinful humans they saw everywhere. Um, and finally, I guess the last slide uh, is... I call this is the title of the, the chapter title duty to a get dead god so i'll just go through this very quickly um well i started talking uh, thinking about duty because nietzsche um nietzsche uh, he sees duty as one of the values that is undermined in the death of god uh, to quote him nobody permits himself any longer to speak without irony of his duty so um um What was I saying? Uh, uh, yeah, so duty is one of the values undermined in, uh, in modernity with the death of God. But why is that? I would argue that it's because the, uh, it's because uh, du duty implies the transcendent within its very definition. To say, I have a duty to do this, it's a duty that you cannot choose for yourself. You can choose to embrace your duty, that could be the free choice, but you can't create your duty. So, the way I put it in my notes is that um, duty cannot be a creative act. We can't we can't create our, our own duty out of nothingness. Th that would that undermines the very notion of duty itself. It's no longer duty, but choice. So you need to have the transcendent, or at least the form of the transcendent, in order to have a duty. You need to posit some sort of transcendent, some sort of big other, in order to say, this is my duty. I'm doing my duty. And I think Hegel and Kant realized this, and this is why Kant says that you don't uh, get your duty from any external imposition, but you choose your own duty. You choose your own... Um, uh, you choose what your own duty is, and that's why you get this empty, um, the empty categorical imperative, where you there is no substantial content to that categorical imperative, right? It's just be consistent or whatever. And Zizek actually, um, he actually, um, when talking about the Kantian categorical imperative, he defends the lack of substance in it, um, actually against Hegel, because Hegel crit critiqued Kant's categorical imperative for lacking substance. Uh, but Zizek says, no, this is the greatness of it, because Kant doesn't no longer relies on any figure of the big other. But the problem is, some sort of big other, some sort of transcendent, is implied within the very notion of duty itself. In order to have duty, in order to say, this is my duty, which I will do, it, it's... Um, it is something that you have to um, receive, that you have to take on for yourself, but it's not something you can create. Because again, if you can create your duty out of the infinite void, you can choose whatever is going to be your duty, that's just a choice. That's choice, and choice is not uh, is not duty. Uh, duty is something different. And that's why in modernity, as Nietzsche says, we can only speak about our duty with irony, because we have lost this notion of the transcendent um, in which the notion of duty is grounded. Um, uh, but now, uh, all we have are modern choices because there is no external other who is commanding us to do our duty. Uh, yeah, so uh, that this last part is less well thought out. I need to think about it more. I need to read more of Kant and Hegel on this, but I thought I would just include that. And um, now, I think I'm going to ask 
I'm going to ask my cousin Nate from the channel Vaisenshow to come on and we can talk a little bit more about the death of God. This went on for about 55 minutes, so pretty good. I hope this lecture was uh, informative and I hope it sort of um, gave a good, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, a good overview of my thoughts on the death of God. So. I will be back in about one minute. In the meantime, I'm going to get my cousin on, and then we are going to talk a little bit more about this idea of the death of God. So I will be right back. Okay, so I'm back. Uh, I'm just going to go through the chat and see if there are any questions. What is the meaning of the death of God in Hegel's philosophy? Um, as the Knight of the World said, there is no big other. That's essentially what it means. The death of God is the death of the substantial external transcendent authority free from contradiction, free from lack. And what we get uh, after the death of Christ is a God himself who is um, who contains, uh, who is a subject. So uh, the crucifixion of Christ is the ultimate example of substance becoming subject. Um, I agree entirely uh, with what you have said, you have to say, but would you believe <coughs> that the church trumps scripture? Um, no, I, I would say that the church does not trump scripture. Uh, the church's teachings are consistent with scripture. Um, Hello, Cousin Nate, are you in? Yeah, just give me a second. I'm just setting stuff up. All right. Sorry, we are just setting this up, and let's see, um, there we go, that's better. So, I have my cousin Nate on right now. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Hey, Nate. <laughs> look at look at the chat right now. We got naked. We got naked HD asking for some ch cheap sex. Nuts. Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. You can, can hear me. Yeah. Did you see? Did you hear what I said? About the chat? No. Oh, no. In the chat right now, we have we have naked eight 
HD XYZ <laughs> from <laughs> talking about cheap sex and dating. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we got rid of that. Um, well, okay, we were going to talk a little bit about um, uh, the negative or reverse Trinitarian structure of of uh, the death of God. And uh, so, everyone, this is Nate. This is my cousin, Nate. Uh, his He has a YouTube channel called Vaisenshow. And uh, he talks a lot about... Uh, biblical typology and theology and whatnot so i have his uh the link to his channel in the description so go go subscribe to him but uh yeah so in the meantime we're going to talk a bit about this uh idea of the reverse structure of uh the reverse trinitarian structure of the death of god i don't know nate do you want to introduce it yeah well i mean uh you've you've already done a a video briefly going over it but i think that there is a, uh, a correction that you realize that we can make to the video after you already if i remember correctly the order that you had the reverse death of the trinity well first of all i guess we should explain what we mean by uh the trinitarian death of god rather than just the general philosophical notion of the death of god uh, when we say trinitarian death of god we just mean that because God is Trinity, everything that happens in history is necessarily Trinitarian, or every event that happens must also happen as if God is Trinity, and that includes man's reaction against God. And so what we see happen progressively throughout the process of Anthros, we see the progressive anti-Trinitarian uh, rejection of God, starting, of course, in with the Great Schism, that's sort of like the death of the Holy Spirit, so to speak, where uh, the communion or the the uh, conciliarity of the church is rejected in place of a single papal authority. And then, of course, we move to the Reformation, which would be the death of the Son, because they reject the, the notion of the Eucharist, which is obviously very important. And there's a lot of other theological errors that have to do with the uh, that have to do with the sun and the incarnation, uh, and then finally, atheism is the death of the father. Precisely, yeah. So, um, essentially, what we see is the um, is well. Let's let's go to uh, first the Great Schism. Um, it's actually interesting that for. All three of the historical epochs that we're talking about, the um, the corresponding heresy has to do mostly with that person, right? So in the Great Schism, um, uh, Cabane, Seraphim Hamilton talks a lot about how the Great Schism, the primary cause was wasn't even papal authority; it was the filioque. It was the fact that um, the uh, Roman Church and other Western churches uh, arbitrarily and without any um, conciliar, um, uh, without any sort of you know uh, conciliar um, act, uh, they added the um, they added uh, the filioque and the son to the um, to the creed, the Nicene Creed, and and the son essentially uh, means uh, in the context it's that. The Holy Spirit no longer proceeds solely from the Father, so in a way, it um, it's more it's complex, but in a way, it sort of threatens the monarchy of the Father that we hold to in the Eastern Church. The fact that th both eh, the Trinity, the source of the other persons in the Trinity, is the Father alone; He is the fount; He is the cause. Um, but this view the filioque sort of undermines that and we get the procession of the holy spirit from the father and the son so um in the great schism we have for one a sort of breakdown of conciliarity in general and conciliarity is understood in terms of the holy spirit the holy spirit is what unites the local um the local um churches into the one body of christ it's not just the single pope who um, just being subject to the Roman pontiff, this isn't what constitutes you as part of the church. It's in being in this larger, uh, 
community united by the Holy Spirit. So in the Great Schism, we have the beginning of the death of God, probably because we have the, um, and it occurs in the form of the death of the Holy Spirit, the third person in the Trinity. Uh, so I don't know if you have anything else to say on that. Well, it, it is really interesting how uh, when we, we look at it in this context, or we look at the Great Schism in the context of the anti-Trinitarian uh, death of God, because, and when we say anti-Trinitarian, and there, there, there's a reason that it follows Holy Spirit, Son, and then Father, and that's because, well, if anybody here has seen the the stuff that we did on the patriarchs and the philosophers, they would know that the Trinitarian, the general Trinitarian pattern, which also follows the pattern of uh, priest, king, prophet, would be Father, Son, and then Holy Spirit. That's the general pattern that we see, like theology, uh, philosophy, and then the sciences. We have that 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 that's another pattern that follows this Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Hmm. So, in the death of God, it of course it has to be the reverse of that. First, it's the death of the Holy Spirit, and then the Son, and then finally the Father. It's the exact reverse of God's self-revelation. Uh, so with the Great Schism, if you view it in the context of it being the death of the Holy Spirit, like you were saying, it makes such perfect sense for it to be uh, caused by the Filioque, which uh, many would argue now, there's, there's, of course, many different interpretations of the Filioque. Like within the West, there is no uh, precise definition of what the Filioque exactly is, which is a problem, but or it's a problem for them. But uh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. Many would argue or certain interpretations of the Filioque are subordinationist. Like they make the Holy Spirit subordinate to the Father and the Son. And they, in a way, literally kill the Holy Spirit. They take everything that makes the Holy Spirit who he is away from him. Uh, and it, it's no coincidence that alongside that, they also take the conciliarity away from the church, which many, which, which I'd say is the action of the Holy Spirit in the church. It's mm -hmm. the making it conciliar. Yeah. It's, it's like the same, um, the same hypostatic property of the, of or like not have property, the the purpose or the role of the Spirit in the Trinitarian life is to unite the Father and the Son in love, is to carry the love of the Father to the Son and uh, back in this procession and reversion. But, um, and this is occurs in the body of Christ, in the church itself, with the, um, with the, uh, uh, conciliarity of, for example, the ecumenical councils, where all of the bishops come together, or uh, the major patriarchal sees at least, they come together and manifest the fullness of the body in Christ, of Christ uh, united in the spirit. So, um, yeah, so that is why. Um, and we can also read this in terms of anthros, where you literally have um, a, a sort of turn away from the conciliar body of Christ and towards this one man who is the Pope. Um, and this is kind of how uh, we can, I haven't really thought too much about it, but this is one way, and at least uh, I can see how the Catholic Church um, began this process of anthros when they schismed from the, uh, when they schismed from the, uh, or when they set up the Pope as an authority over the other bishops in a way that is, was inconsistent with the, um, with the first millennium church. And I think Anthros probably has its origins like way back. It was, it's, it's always been around because Anthros is not, nothing more than pride. But Anthros in history is just pride becoming manifest. In, and of course, this occurs through the turning away from God. This is this is a that's why that's why the death of God is a profoundly Christian concept, and we can sort of reclaim the death of God from the atheist philosophers um, by showing how not only is it a, a Christian concept in terms of anthros, in terms of it simply being pride, that just as the Bible says, the turn from God is a turn to pride. It occurs through pride. 
Um, but it literally occurs in a reverse Trinitarian fashion, just the way you would expect um, it to occur, considering the Trinitarian structure of history itself, which we haven't actually defended that here. And that's what someone said in our video. <laughs> someone commented, like, we haven't defended the idea that uh, history occurs in a Trinitarian pattern, but, like, it's sort of, that's too big of an idea for here. You just got to trust us. So <laughs> that sort of... Trust the process. Yeah, just trust the plan, as Nick Fuentes would say. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we can talk about the sun now a bit more. I would say that the biggest example of the death, uh, or the biggest uh, heresy, um, well, I don't even know. Well, it's not even a heresy, really. It's just a consequence of what they did for the Protestants was schisming from the Catholic Church and setting up their own arbitrary hierarchies and breaking apostolic succession because when they did that they lost access to all of the sacraments except for baptism um so uh really they uh they the protestants according to um well it's some people would argue catholics as well but um from an orthodox perspective but um According to Vatican II, at least, Protestants don't have the Eucharist the same way the Catholics and Orthodox do, be, precisely because they, the way they schismed um, led them to break apostolic succession. So the Protestants uh, do not have the body of Christ in the sense of the Eucharist. Uh, and the Eucharist is like, the body of Christ, the Son of God. So um, they lost that. So that is, that is an example of the death of the negation of the Son in the Reformation. But there's also the uh, Christological, uh, maybe not Christological heresies, but uh, heresies related to the Atonement, which was sort of the essence of, of uh, Reformed and Lutheran theology. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I'm not very familiar with uh, Lutheran and Reformed theology, so I don't really have much to say in terms of the theories of their atonements or uh, how they uh the way that they view the the cross and the crucifixion but it's also interesting to note it to note just how how many christologic actual logical heresies have arisen within protestantism like it, it you go to any sort of low church today and you'll see nestorianism arianism you'll see all these very to us very obvious obviously heretical views just being openly openly preached and it's like that's that's the problem when you don't have apostolic succession and that's why it makes so it that's why it's not a coincidence that it's in the death of the son so to speak within this trinitarian anti-trinitarian death of god it's within the epoch of the death of the son that we have these christological heresies popping up again everywhere yeah yeah exactly and um uh, just to comment on the atonement a bit, you can see Anthros there very clearly in the case of seeing um, uh, the Catholic doctrine of Catholic and Orthodox doctrine of justification as uh, a not purely extrinsic. It's not simply you are pronounced righteous externally, and you have the imputation, the external imputation of Christ of Christ's uh, what's the term? His righteousness. Uh, yeah. Yeah. His righteousness. Instead, you have uh, an internal transformation, and that constitutes salvation and justification and glorification, and um, sanctification. And uh, the um, the Protestants, they um, in seeing man everywhere, in seeing uh, in anthropomorph anthropomorphizing the Christian worldview, seeing man where God had once been they recoiled from man in disgust. And one of the best examples of this is monergism, their rejection of uh, the our view of salvation, which is synergism, where the human will freely cooperates with the grace of God. Instead, they have, uh, especially among the Reformed Calvinists, it is all the act of God himself. It is God who is the ultimate uh, cause of everything, who makes this free uh, choice to save who he wishes to save and damn who he wishes to damn. It, there is nothing to do with human free will. And this has to do with Anthros because in the Catholic doctrine, they saw man. They saw man, they saw, and of course, Luther was always scared because he saw himself as such a sinful creature. How could I ever be saved? Well, he found comfort in the 
uh, in his notion that it was all God's work. It had nothing to do with him, actually. It and um, so, uh, and I think it sort of was in some ways justified in because there were there was like a legalism in Western Catholicism that led to Luther's uh, anxiety about his salvation. But at the same time, uh, um, it was. Um, according to us, from an orthodox perspective, a heretical view. And actually, you know what's funny? I realized this a while back, um, and it's that the Protestant um, notion of salvation is not true, but it is sort of true in their context. Um, in, like, for example, the fact that Protestants, at least everyone except for Anglicans, but even Anglicans probably, I don't know. But um, uh, it's, the, the Protestants will argue that they, it's not an internal transformation that leads to salvation, but it is uh, God choosing to count you among the saved. But in a way, because they don't have the body of Christ, because they, um, because they are outside of the body of Christ in that sense, even though they're baptized, so it's it's different. But they don't have life in them. That is what our our Lord said. They do not have uh, uh, the Eucharist, so they do not have life in them. But um, so in a way, they say that it has to be purely external, and the irony is that in a way, it kind of is. So like when Protestants are saved, they have to be added um, into the body of Christ by this external act of grace of God. Like um, this is what sort of the modern Orthodox view is of the salvation of those outside of the body. It's that they haven't they haven't cho chosen to actively and willfully participate in the body uh, in terms of the sacraments of the Eucharist and the fullness of the church, non-schismatic church, but um, they're still participating in the body of Christ due to the grace of God in their own way. So in the irony of Protestantism is that they will claim that salvation is only through this act of grace of God counting you among the righteous and because they don't even have the means of an internal theosis because they don't have a Eucharist it sort of is, is a self uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way a self-actualizing belief in terms of soteriology that's sort of the irony I yeah recognize. that's a good one that that's clever that's that's a good one uh, <laughs> I feel like something uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> Something that's uh, something that's interesting to consider is how every error within this era of the death of God is directly related to a failure to understand how creation partic participates in the intertrinitarian relationship between Father and Son through the Spirit. It, we have to consider, uh, and we have to go all the way back to Genesis one to two to understand this really. Uh, God created the world within this tr intertrinitarian context. The Father gives creation to the Son as a gift, and then the Son then transforms creation and gives it back to the Father. That's that's the way that it works, and this happens through the Spirit. So the errors in Protestantism lies in their inability to grasp how exactly it is that we join ourselves to the Son's reciprocation of creation back up to the Father. And I mean, it's pretty well spelled out for us in Genesis 2 how that's supposed to happen. It's a, it's a Eucharistic task in the very definition of the word Eucharist. It's a, it's a task of going out, thanking God for creation, transforming it and bringing it back up to God, and joining the creation to the archetype of creation, who is the Logos, the uncreated. Uh, we, we join creation to its uncreated archetype in the Logos, and it's in doing that, it's in bringing creation up to God, uh, or up to the Son, that creation is then reciprocated back to the Father. Like the, every, every error within Protestantism can really be boiled down to a failure to understand how exactly it is that creation participates in the intertrinitarian relationship. Right, because, I mean, the whole thing is they sort of dis introduce a disharmony into the balance of procession and reversion where you yeah. have instead because that's what all synergy is that's what it's the concept is expressing expressing is this idea that god gives to us and we give back in thanks um i don't know if you mentioned that that's what the eucharist means that is yeah. the meaning of the eucharist is uh giving thanks so um i mean that's sort of the not irony but the um 
sort of weird logic of the Eucharist is that we are literally offering God back to God, right? So we are doing, yeah. we, and that is, so, but that is what God himself does, is it not? In the Trinitarian relationship for all time. And yep. salvation as a uh, modern orthodoxy, but uh, for like, especially the Eastern fathers have emphasized this a lot, but salvation uh, is constituted by a sort of kenosis, a self-emptying, where you, instead of holding on to yourself and enclosing yourself within yourself, you open yourself up to the other. And this is, of course, expresses the Trinitarian rela relationship of, of uh, uh, eternal perfect communion. So in salvation, you are giving yourself up to God. You, you get all your being from God, and then you give this being back to God. And this relationship of of mutual um mutual giving mutual love this is salvation this is how we are meant to be and uh just uh on the topic of the trinitarian relationship uh we talked about this earlier this week staniloi Dimi dimitru staniloi the uh orthodox uh romanian theologian of the 20th century he talks about how the eye of the father isn't some self-referential eye that then after establishing establishing itself as an individual goes into communion with the other persons so it's not like we have this self isolated eyes who are in communion but imminent to the very eyeness of the father of the selfhood of the father is a relationship with the father uh, with the son and the spirit and this actually um, is implied within the very word father because you can only be a father in relation to the son you can only be a son in relation in relation to the father so um, the very eyeness as Stanley talks about in theology in the church I think the book is called um, he talks about how the very subjectivity of the Trinity um, each person while irreducibly distinct this very distinction occurs in communion the eyeness of the father exists in its being in communion with the father and son uh, with the uh, son and the spirit and this is sort of like a mystery that we can't comprehend but it is the revealed uh, truth of our humble god uh, who is always self-emptying to the other persons yeah and that's why humility is the mother of all virtues is that that Humility and pride, is what and pride is the source of all evils, as Saint John Cassius yeah, says. Exactly, uh, humility is what constitutes reality, because without the other, there is nothing. Nothing exists without the other. Uh, like God cannot exist outside of this trinitarian context. He necessarily exists as trinitarian communion, because without communion, there is no existence. And, and that's why, this, like, again, we, we can take this, like, think about A equals A. Hegel makes the point that yeah. A equals A is an empty tautology. And ultimately, um, in order to have this notion of a distinct A, it has to be in context, in relation, in, like, distinguished from B. Like, just imagine an A in empty space. Well, that A is, has to be distinct from that empty space, right? So you already, within the very identity of A itself, you have the non, the, the, uh, the non-A. So, um, as you were saying, uh, self-identity, no, being a, a pure self-identity literally is nothingness. That's why hell is a full actualization of nothingness, because it's a pure self-relating negativity, to use Zizekian terminology. Yeah, and... Um... Like, think about it like this. If if every if there were only one color in the world, let's say everything was yellow, we would never develop a word for yellowness because that's just everything. Without something else to compare something to, that thing does not exist. Uh, and this is why it makes perfect sense that following the death of the Son, we have the death of the Father. Because without the, the Father and the Son together, there is neither son nor father you can't have one or the other you have to have both with the holy spirit as well so it makes perfect sense that following the death of the son naturally that or well i guess unnaturally because this is a a movement contrary to nature or contrary to the patterns uh, embedded in nature uh so unnaturally that that necessarily leads to the death of the father because without the father Without the son, you can't have the father. You you can't just have a, a, a 
the Father as God. You can't just have a, a unipersonal God. That that's impossible. Right. Um, that like the pure monad of Aristotle or Islam. That is what. Yeah. Uh, that is what doesn't exist. So I guess now we can sort of. Uh, maybe conclude by talking about the father and the death of the father. This is probably the easiest to grasp because it is the death of God as Nietzsche talks about. And that is the limitation of Nietzsche. For one, he doesn't see the death of God as anthros. He doesn't see that there has to be a positivity that is the flip side of the negativity of the death of God. There is no pure negation. So, um, it's not that we turn towards... It's not that the undermining of values occurs because we we um, turn away from God and just face nothingness, but it's that we turn away from God through the mediation of man, and then we realize that man is unable to establish values for us. So it's always through the mediation of man. That's why we need to take into account Anthros. Um, but he also didn't notice the Trinitarian uh, relation, uh, pattern here, and he didn't see how the death of God goes back a thousand years. It goes back to the Great Schism, and the germs, the... the uh, you know, like essence of it has existed forever. It's existed ever since Satan uh, fell. So um, um, that's all the death of God is uh, at a societal scale. It's this, um, well, it was the collapse of the Christian worldview in the reverse of the way it was established. Um, it was established in a Trinitarian way. It collapses in a negative Trinitarian way. It was established through man in humility, embracing the transcendent God. It was negated through man uh, negating the transcendent God through embracing himself. And this is what Nietzsche didn't realize. So even if he provides a pretty decent, a pretty decent, a uh, decent explanation of the death of God as, um, uh, in terms of the father, the death of the father, he doesn't actually provide a suit or a, a very, uh, uh, comprehensive, uh, definition and explanation of the death of God as a whole. So again, yeah, all he really uh, does is recognize the death of the Father. And of course, isn't that interesting that you can still have morality after the death of the Holy Spirit and the Son, but once you get rid of the source, the source of everything, the source of the Father and the Son, uh, the Father, the fountain of life, you get, uh, you no longer have a source for values. The values collapse into man. So, um, it's, it's with the death of the Father that you get nihilism and the final atheistic world that we are really living in today. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, when you look at it in this context, it becomes so obvious that throughout history, you see this sort of simultaneous movement from unity out towards uh I don't want to say multiplicity, but in a, yeah, a movement away from unity towards multiplicity, but you also see a movement away from communion towards hmm. self-referentiality. Atomization. It's, yeah, atomization. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. You see, originally there's there's the one church, but many everybody is participative of the one unified church. And then the Great Schism, you see they move out or... Uh, the, there's no longer just one unified church, and they're moving out towards their own little artificial particularities and then in the death of the sun there's thousands of new denominations that pop up but within these different denominations you see the exact same errors popping up it's like they they agree on most things they just have these superficial differences that they use as ways to fundamentally divide themselves from each other it's like the same way that uh, the the idea of the heat death of the universe is where there's all these, there's an infinite number of black holes that are all literally identical to each other, but mm. they're unable to commune with each other. Right, right. It's the inferno of the same, as Han puts it. And what I just realized is that this Protestant idea of unity, where it's just a unity in spirit, we don't need actual communion, that is a product of the death of sun, of the sun. There doesn't have to be this concrete unity of the body. There doesn't in like in the sun in the body yeah, of christ that's a good one. you just get the pure uh th this pure spirituality empty vacuous spirituality yeah. wherein even if we have literally like lutherans and calvinists they contradict each other like they don't believe the same thing but still they remain in communion or they don't remain in communion rather they have this spiritual unity because of their belief in christ that's how it goes but their belief in christ isn't a um 
it, it's not concrete. It's not, um, it, there is no substance to it. And this substance is fundamentally the Eucharist, the body of Christ. And that's what they've lost. So that's why you get this, this different notion of unity that is based on that because this unity is inherently Christological and they have killed the son. Yeah. They, they D de, they de incarnate God. Exactly. Um, and that's, that's why, that's why it's fundamentally an issue of their inability to understand the, the inherent Eucharistic diet, the intertrinitarian Eucharistic dialogue that is the foundation of what reality is. Like creation doesn't exist outside of the Eucharistic dialogue of the Trinity. We're just participants in that Eucharistic dialogue. We only exist in the context of the Son giving himself to the Father. Like that, that's.